I'm Chris Mitchell with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and I'm here in Austin, Texas at the Broadband Community Summit talking with local community leaders who have made interesting investments to improve internet access. Today I'm here at Terry Huval. Welcome to the show. Well, I'm happy to be here, Chris. Good seeing you again. Um, tell us who you are, where you're from. Well, um, my name is Trevor Huval. I'm actually was born in Texas, so I'm kind of like back back home. I, was, I lived in Texas for a year and a half as a, as a baby, and then my parents moved back to Louisiana. Uh, I live in Lafayette, Louisiana, the heart of Cajun country, uh, where we speak French, eat crawfish, dance, and have a good time. And we have some of the fastest broadband in the world, and uh, so it's been a it's been a wonderful ride, and uh, so so happy to be here in Austin to hear all the great stories and great testimonies from others who are involved in trying to bring gigabit uh, systems to the rest of the country. You're also a bit of a fiddle player. Just tell us a little briefly about that. Well, uh, obviously, I'm kind of caught up with fiber, you know, whether it's fiber in, a, in providing telecommunication services or fiber on strings or fiddle bows. I, I started off playing guitar as a 10-year-old, learned from a male auto catalog how to play in my family. Nobody played music, and uh, as time went on, I learned how to play the violin. Lost a couple of roommates in college in the process because it really sounded bad. Uh, and as time was going on, I've had a chance to travel a lot of the country and travel in Europe, uh, play in um, a lot of fun places. I, it's been great. I, uh, I got a band that includes my brother, and we've been together for like 27 years. I have the three boys and all three of my boys play uh, music and um, two of them play in a Cajun band. Uh, they all uh, know how to speak French so we we're able to kind of carry on the heritage going forward. So for, for me it's been wonderful to be able to stay at home, we deal with a, with a world-class organization uh, to do some great things for our community and to be able to um, be part of the Cajun culture that's so important to, to me and so many other people there. So let's talk about uh, 15, almost 20 years ago. Um, Lafayette has a fiber ring, you have a new mayor, and you're not sure if you're going to keep your job or not as the director of the Lafayette Utilities System. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background and what happened in, that set you on the course of ultimately building this network in the community? Yeah, well, what happened is uh, in uh, 1994 is when I went to work with the city of Lafayette, and I had been in the electric utility business all my life working career. I worked it for a, a, an investor-owned utility when I was in college, worked for another investor-owned utility for 16 years, and had this opportunity to become director of utilities for the city of Lafayette, so I was able to stay home and be my hometown. Uh, we needed to replace our microwave telecommunication system that was essential to run our electric system with something else, and fiber was the most um, uh, logical thing for us to do. We, we, did some research and realized that was the direction we wanted to go in. I'm curious, the option would have been there to lease. Can you tell me why is it important for a utility to own its own fiber or microwave, whatever that transmission system is? Yeah, well, when you get take a look at the, at the critical nature of operating a, tele, a, a telecommunications, a, a transmission system, you look at what it takes to operate a utility system, you have to have ownership and control of that of that system and it's even become worse now with the new North American Electric Reliability Council mandates the, the, the utility system has to own and have control over that because it has has so much impact on what can happen to a community. So my, from our perspective it was never a debate. We knew we were going to have to own our own system. Now the tele, telecom companies suggested they could do this stuff and whenever I asked them I said which city or which utility system you're doing this for then you end up with this head bowed down and you know they weren't telling me the truth. Uh, so we we started looking at it, we started getting pushed back from the cable TV and telephone company. It took about a year and a half to get past some of the politics of it all and finally got support to building our own uh, telecommunications ring around the city and that was right about the time that the Telecommunications Act of 1996 had been passed and we thought you know if we're going to put the fiber up let's put enough up there in case of some new telecom entrants that want to come into Lafayette that they could take advantage of it so we, we went from what would have been a 12 fiber ring to a 96 fiber ring and only cost us an extra 20 percent more to do that because the biggest cost of putting the fiber up is actually the labor involved so that's what we did and I guess that, that we did what we wanted to do for our utility system. Well, then the Chamber of Commerce comes knocking on the door and says, you know what, last mile solutions in Lafayette are pretty difficult. And we're trying to keep a lot of these oil and gas companies in Lafayette and not make them feel like they have to move to Houston to be able to get that type of technology. Can you guys provide last mile? So we talked about it, decided we would do that, got into that business, 
within a couple of years we're making money on it. And then we get the other knock on the door from council members, from people in the community saying, you know, we really need to have competition for cable TV. And I said, I don't want to, I really wasn't excited about that idea. But what we did know is that the internet was really, the, that was what was coming down the line. That was going to be the electricity of the future. The same thing that happened in 1896 when our citizens in Lafayette said, we want to have electricity in Lafayette before somebody else tells us that we can have electricity in Lafayette. We want to have it now. And so we, began discussing this, had a new mayor in town. I actually, um, actually was in the campaign commercial of my new mayor's uh, opposition, so I had no idea if I would have a job with him. Fortunately, he was uh, wise enough, I think, to keep me on. And I was Joy Durrell, and in 2004, we made the decision to start looking into it, and as soon as we did, we got pushed back from the telephone company and the cable company and had to uh, fight with some difficult legislation, got sued multiple times, cost us over four million dollars, had to have a public election. It was a long, long trek and finally in 2009 started providing services to our first customers. So we fought basically five years, you know, having to go through the, all of the maze of not only planning for the system but also having to deal with the opposition to be able to get there. And um, so that's, that, that's, a, that's a long answer to your short question, but that's kind of how we got to the point of actually building a system that evolves into what we have today. Well, I actually know that that was the abbreviated version because of all the things that happened. So I, I much appreciate the detail. Um, tell us, what is the situation today? You know, um, let's start with just non-internet access related, non-telecommunications. How has the, the fiber uh, benefited the utility in other ways that people might not immediately appreciate? Well, the, the first thing it, it gave us a chance to do is to really um, uh, uh, in, uh, allow us to, to put in our smart grid system very quickly. So we already had our fiber system up at the same time. We were about ready to put our, our uh, smart grid system in. So it, that, that, that took place almost seamlessly. Now it's really easy to do. Beyond that point, we were able to put an outage management system in place that's helped us improve our response times in dealing with uh, electrical outages to customers because now we know when our customer's lights are out uh, without the customer having to call us up. Mm -hmm. And we can more more quickly detect where the outage is, get somebody to get it fixed uh, a, lot, a lot better than we ever did before. And so all of our reliability numbers from uh, uh, numbers of outages as well as the duration of outages have dropped significantly because we're now able to respond more, more quickly to that. Then we started using the system for our sewer uh, uh, operations. And the sewer system, no one likes to talk about it very much, but you know, you gotta have it to have a, a safe community. It's better than not talking, it's better than not having it and having to talk about that. Exactly, and so we have a lot of sewer lift stations, a lot of pumps that, we, that are part of that process that in the old days, the way you knew there was a problem with, the, with those pumps is that a red light would come on and somebody was supposed to call and say, oh, the red light's on, somebody's somewhere wrong with the pump. Well, that's not a very good reactionary way to do it. Now we have monitoring and control of all those ourselves, and so we can anticipate when issues are going to be affecting us, especially during heavy rainfalls. And plus, we can use, now we can use the system. If we are having an issue somewhere, there are ways that we can manipulate how, which pumps run, which ones don't, to be able to let the system help to absorb any uh, you know, situations that occur because of heavy rains, et cetera. Then we're also using the system, to, the telecommunication system, to help us monitor our water pressures uh, and help us to be able to control the valves on our system for different situations. For example, if we're having a, a heavy use uh, summertime usage of water, and let's say there was a, a fire to place in, in a location, then we can open up, we can either close or open up uh, uh, water towers in the area to help us more effectively fight the fires and still be able to deal with uh, with providing good service to our customers. So that's you know very fundamental to the utility system. It's just been a really great thing for us. And the police department has fallen in love with this system because they can get really low cost cameras. We're all over town either from a you know we can either get to them wirelessly in the areas where we do have a Wi-Fi available, or we can time onto our system. And now they can build a better monitor uh, issues with to traffic control as well as for, for, to try, try to avert crimes or at least know what took place and build a follow-up with it from there. So it's been, as it goes along, you see more and more enthusiasm uh, because we have now a technology that is and it's so pervasive around the town that, that we can do some really, I think, powerful things. 
And you've mentioned a lot of different ways the utility system is using the system, is using the fiber system. I also know that a number of years back, you came up with a figure as to how all of the utilities being owned by the city has benefited. I mean, do you remember that number in terms of all the, the financial benefits to the city um, from having it? I remember it was in the millions, certainly. Yeah, and that was from the, for the telecommunications side, be able to have that capability oh, or just everything. just everything. But the utility system is a $250 million a year business to begin with. That's an electric water and sewer system by itself. The telecom system is a tool that helps us be able to operate that better. You know, when we looked at power outages perspectives, I, I forgot what the number was, but I had looked at if we can reduce power outages from uh, durations from, um, I think it was like about an uh, average of an hour before to, to half an hour, then what, what we're doing is saving our customers somewhere around $13 million a year in, in the cost of a power outage. Because the power, cost of a power outage has a lot of impacts to that. You got snarls up on the streets so people can't get to where they're going. You got businesses that are shut down when there's a power outage. You got, you know, the residential, you got all the things that people have to do to be able to, um, you know, backup generators. I had a guy told me the other day, he says, you know, when we had a hurricane about 10 years ago, he says, I bought a backup generator. I would have never bought that if, if I, if I, we had the system that we had now, I said, because you'll hardly ever out, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you know, there's, been, there's a lot of spillover effect on how much people have saved because we can now have a more reliable uh, utility system because of the telecommunication system. Right. And we've, we've written a lot and we've talked about all the jobs that have moved to town. What I'm curious about is you spent a lot of years fighting for the right to be able to build this network and then you spent a lot of years working to get it rolled out correctly. Do you have a favorite impact or result of the network at this point in terms of how it's benefited the community? Uh, my favorite impact with the network right now is that it's making money. And because that was such a challenge for us. We had adversaries, not only by our competitors, but also by people who have a bent against government being involved in this kind of business. I had council members that would try to uh, make it difficult for me to explain my story in a public meeting because they wanted to see us fail, which is kind of really ridiculous when you get to thinking about it. And, and one of the things that they would use is that our financials in our early years did not look good. Well, you know what, if you're going to build a system like this, it's going to cost you $125 million and you have to borrow the money before you can serve customer number one, guess what, you're going to be underwater for the first several years. Mm -hmm. And and we had we were underwater for longer than we expected to because we had some issues with the technology that we had first deployed, the vendor didn't do what they should have done, uh, we, had, we were having to fight all the battles to get cable TV carriage rights. Uh, we had to go to the FCC to finally get uh, some attention on that. Uh, it was just like one thing after the other just kept on pulling us away from you know, what we needed to do to, to build and operate the system to have to deal with these other distractions. And in the last uh, several years, we've gone to the point now to where not only have we always paid our debt service each year, which was imperative, we also paid our operations costs, and now we've got enough cash to build to reinvest in the system. So now we're at a point where I can still so proudly say that we're making money on the system. And so to think that now we have a system in place that not only does all these powerful things that we just talked about, but yet it's making money also. And in fact, this year, that system is going to, going to generate $200,000 and go to the general fund of the city to help to support the cost of hiring fire and policemen and all those kinds of things. And next year, that number is going to be 400000 And the following year, is going to be 600000 go up to where it's going to be $1.2 million that the general fund of the city will have without having to raise taxes and be able to, to, be able to provide more services to the community because we have this cash generating tele telecommunication system so now it becomes you know now the, it, it becomes full circle you know now we have a system that's done some very powerful things giving us la a lot of positive attention and it's making enough money to where it helps the city be able to pr provide its um, it, it, what it wants to provide to the community in a better way terrific thank you so much for for sharing that with us as well as sharing your fiddle playing okay thank you it was an honor to do so